Hi everyone. So for the second lecture, we're going to talk about change of basis. So what happens to the components of <coughs> vectors relative to one basis if we change basis? Well, I'm telling you, this whole talking to a computer thing is, it takes some getting used to <clears throat> compared to teaching in class or even in a Zoom meeting or something, but we'll get there. All right, so given two bases for a given vector space, we'll call the bases F and G and the vector space V. say f is equal to the set of vectors little f sub i <coughs> i going from 1 up to n where n is the dimension of v and g is the same but with vectors that we'll call g sub i. Then the elements of one basis can be uniquely expressed as linear combinations of the elements of the other, since they're a basis. So you, you remember from last time that given a basis, any vector can be expressed uniquely as a linear combination of the elements of the basis. So we'll start by expressing the f's in terms of the g's. We'll say F1 is equal to F11 G1. So this is just a list of n times n scalars here, this F11 through Fnn <coughs> plus F1, 2, G2, plus all the way up to F1, N, G, N. And then f2 would look similar, except where the first index on those f's on the right-hand side will be 2. We can write this out in matrix form. <clears throat> 
vector f1, and then the vector f2, all the way down to fn. is equal to F11 F12 21 all the way down to F and N times G1, G2, all the way down <clears throat> to Gn. And we'll call this matrix of scalars here A. They're the scalar components of the various Fs relative to the Gs. Um, and this is not what we're going to call later a tensor. This is just a matrix equation. It's just a set of equations defining the Fs in terms of the Gs. So eventually we're going to run into these objects called second order tensors that are linear transformations on a vector space. And they map vectors to vectors. And if you pick a basis, then you'll be able to represent them in matrix form. But the matrix form depends on the basis that you pick, whereas the tensors are something intrinsic. So this is just some equations defining <coughs> the correspondence between the elements of the basis F and the elements of the basis G. <coughs> We know that the matrix A is invertible because both F and G are bases for V. Right, and all that means, so we know that because that means that we could also express the G's as linear combinations of the, uh, the F's. Um, so we could have, you know, some matrix of components times the vector of F's is equal to the vector of G's. And um, because of that, then the other matrix has to be the inverse of A. Okay, so that's how the components of the basis go. You know, the, the Fs are expressed as linear combinations of the Gs in that way. Or you can send the Gs to the Fs using the matrix A. You know, you you multiply this through and that gives you the Fs. Well, what if we want to express the components of a vector relative to a different basis? So say we have the components of a vector relative to perhaps the basis of Gs, and we want to express the components of the vector relative to the Fs. Then, you know, this A matrix is going to be helpful in doing that. <clears throat> 
but we'll find that you don't just multiply the components by a. Um, it's going to turn out to be a's inverse transpose, which we'll show. So say we have some vector v, which is a member of the vector space. And we know the components of v relative to f, or g rather, we'll say. So that would be v is equal to vi gi. <clears throat> and we'd like to find the components of v relative to the basis f. So it'd be, we'll say V is equal to V prime I F I. So we want to know the V primes from the V I's and from A. And so in order to do that, we'll say <clears throat> V is equal to V I G I, <coughs> which is also equal to V I prime F I where these, you know, I repeated index here implies summation from 1 to n. We also know that 
fi is equal to a i j times g j. And we can do some index switching here. So instead of making i the free index, so when there's a free index, it implies a list of n elements. So the free index here is i. So this is a list of nine equations for you know the nine f's relative to a and g. Um, and then j is a dummy index that is repeated, so it implies summation. Um, we could replace the j with a k in the right-hand side here. It wouldn't matter um, as long as it's repeated and you don't repeat it somewhere else in the same term. <clears throat> so we could also just as easily say or list it over j instead of i. Right, so we just kind of switched what I meant and what J meant. And as long as you do it consistently <coughs> across all terms, you'll be fine. All right. So now, let's say V prime I fi, <clears throat> well, we could switch the i to a j there. It doesn't matter. So that would be v prime j fj. All right. And now we have this expression here for fj up above. Um, you know, we could have used the fi one and switched the indices in our head. But I like kind of writing out the steps. Um, explicitly. <clears throat> a little less error prone that way if you actually write how to construct fj from a and g rather than how to construct fi and then try to switch the indices in your head. Um, you know, it's easy to forget to flip them in a term or something is all. So, you know, that's equal to vj prime, well, fj is a j i g i. Yeah. <clears throat> now, one thing to, it took me, you know, years ago when I was first having my graduate level courses and you know, first ran into these summation conventions and indices and everything. Um, you have a term like this here where it's like, well, this is a, you know, one by n list and this is an n by n list. So it's kind of like, it's the same formula for matrix multiplication. But, um, you know, it doesn't matter because these are all just scalars here. Um, you know, that the vector is the GI here. So the, the order, you know, the row and column ordering of everything is handled by the order of the, uh, the subscripts here. So, you know, your, your matrix, like what's transposed and what's a column vector and a row vector and all that stuff is handled by by the subscripts here. In other words, um, it doesn't matter what the order here is. Like A, J, that's not a J. I don't know what it did. All right. A, J, I, V, J prime is the same thing as V, J prime AJI, right, because I is <clears throat> the free index, and for each I, it's just the sum of over those J's. Um, <clears throat> so it's not the same 
what is the same as matrix multiplication, but the order doesn't matter because the order is contained in the uh, the indices and not in the fact that we're doing matrix stuff. The way that you would typically, you know, your, your usual matrix multiplication would be like, um, But that would be uh, one that would get like, we'll say we'll put this in matrix form. So this will be a column vector of i's, all right? And so the, the square brackets here I'm saying is the matrix representation of this thing. Um, so that would give you, you know, your typical a11, a21, a12, all the way down to, we'll call that A22, all the way down to A N. And then V1, V2. All the way down to Vn. <clears throat> so, you know, the, you can make them correspond to <coughs> matrix multiplication. Um, you know, but that's that's the same as that. So, really, all I'm saying is that it. The, the index notation handles all of the matrix stuff and it makes it so that it um, the multiplication commutes you know the the order of these scalar components in your index notation stuff does not matter whereas of course the order of multiplication and matrix math does all right so that was a little bit of an side there. I'll kind of cut that off. All right, so going back to the expression up here. Um, well, if V is equal to Vj prime, A, J, I, <clears throat> G, I. Well, we also know by the way that we defined it that it is equal to V, I, G, I. All right, so we can look at this for each I. Um, in other words, we can look at just the ith component of this relative to the g's, you know, you can like factor out basically the gi, and this is where you get a free index. So the ith component is this and this. All right, <clears throat> so we have Vj prime A J I is equal to Vi. So if we think of the transpose of a matrix, then 
um, where we're talking about the matrix transpose. Well, A transpose the IJ component of it <clears throat> is equal to A J I, right? You're just switching <clears throat> the order of the two things. Um, so we see here that V J prime A transpose Well, we'll just leave that. Yeah, this is equal to VI. So now this is kind of in your typical, you know, matrix where it's the summation is over the second index. Um, and so then you could do the matrix inverse <clears throat> which we'll probably want to yeah we'll switch the i's and j's Excuse me. is equal to <clears throat> and that's going to be now v j all right so we can multiply through oh, i'm looking at my notes here yeah that'll work <clears throat> And multiply through by um, the inverse transpose then. Oopsies. That's got to be an I there. All right. So that would be... And then we'll multiply A transpose J I. Maybe this will actually be easier if we just leave it as A I J. There we go. Should make it a little less confusing. Okay, so <clears throat> if we think of the way that you multiply matrices together, um, then your normal matrix multiplication, if you had A 
I, K, B, K, J um, is equal to C, I, J. So it's the, um, you know, the, the one where the repeated index is on, is the second entry would be the one that would be your normal like left multiplying matrix. And the one where the repeated index is your first entry would be the one, you know, that's going to look like that. Um, all right, so you should have seen in the textbook, there's this delta ij, which is the, um, the alternating, or rather the chronic or delta, right? So that is one if i is equal to j, zero otherwise. Right, and so um, then you have a, i, k, a inverse, k, j, is equal to delta i, j, which is just the index form <coughs> of, um, <coughs> you know, your definition of the inverse, which is that multiplication by the inverse gives you the identity. Um, which in, you know, matrix form, the identity is this delta ij, if you kind of drew it out as a matrix. All right, so in that case, prime a i j is equal to v j like that All right, so we can multiply through by <clears throat> a inverse on both sides. In fact, let's multiply through by A inverse transpose. And it'll be in the matrix sense of right multiply. that'll be equal to V J A inverse <clears throat> Yeah. Uh -huh. 
I've done something wrong with this here, so I'd kind of gone about it from a different way in my notes. Um, so we'll go about it that way, and I'll try to come about it this way separately. All right, so we'll just kind of can we lasso select it? Is that what that does? Nope. Eh. There we go. All right, so the easier way of going about it, <coughs> which was a lot more straightforward, was to do this. All right, so that is equal. This term here is um, the same as Vj prime times a transpose. I J. All right, so then if V of I, you know, the, the, the one that's relative to the G's and not relative to the F's, is A I J transpose the matrix transpose that is times v j prime which is you know a j i v j prime then if you just you know multiply by the inverse then you end up with um, well, you know, yeah. <clears throat> the components going from relative to F there we go. The components going from relative to F to relative to G go with the transpose here. So going the other way, they go with the inverse transpose. In other words, what you'll end up with is VI times A inverse 
i j is equal to v j prime um, and you know the, the way that you would usually look at those I think we probably usually think of j as a dummy index and i is a free one typically so that would usually be written as um, v i prime is equal to a inverse j or i j yeah j i times v j <clears throat> so this is the inverse transpose here right because the summation is over the first index in the matrix here rather than the second oopsies All right, so the matrix A that sends the vectors G over to the vectors F things that behave that way are called covariant because they go with the matrix A. But um, the components go kind of against that. Right, so that goes with a inverse transpose i j v j so the components are contravariant is what they're called so that's um a little bit of a weird formula but what it basically means is that the the inverse there means that you know if we scale up the vectors g as we go to f. So say that all the f's are just double what the um, the g's are. Oopsies. Then um, then the components should all get halved. <clears throat> Things like that. Um, all right, so we can check that this works on a simple example in R2, which you should always, when you're, you know, doing derivations like this, try them out on a simple example and make sure that, you know, they, they stand the st sniff test. So let's see if this works. So in R2, let's say that G1 is equal to the unit vector in the x direction, and G2 is equal to the unit vector in the y direction, <clears throat> and then F1 is equal to the unit vector in the y direction, and f2 is equal to minus the unit vector in the x direction. So in other words, the f vectors are just the g vectors rotated 90 degrees in the uh, counterclockwise sense, right? <coughs> so we can set that up. Your A matrix is 0, 1, negative 1, 0, 
which is a 90 degree rotation. All right, so let's say we have a vector v, and it is 1 g1 plus 2 g2, or um, ex plus 2 ey, where those are unit vectors. Um, that's what the little hat above will generally mean in this class. All right, so that is equal to v1 g1 plus v2 g2. So v1 is equal to 1, v2 is equal to 2. <clears throat> well, since a is a, um, a rotation, we know that A transpose is the same as A inverse. Um, so A inverse transpose is just A. But you could also verify that A inverse is A transpose by, you know, the determinant of A here is 1, and then just using your normal 2 by 2 matrix inverse formula, you get A inverse is equal to zero, negative one, one, zero, which is pretty easy to see is a transpose. All right, so if we use our formula from earlier, which is that the coordinates go with the inverse transpose of A, then what we have, we should have V1 prime v2 prime, the coordinates relative to the basis of f's instead of g, is equal to a inverse transpose v1 v2. And that's the same only in this case because we had a rotation. You know, if there was some scaling and stuff, this wouldn't be a. It would just be a inverse transpose. <clears throat> So that is just for this choice of A. All right. Well, A inverse transpose times V1, V2. We get um, V1 prime, V2 prime. is equal to 0, 1, negative 1, 0 times 1, 2. So that is equal to 2, negative 1. All right, so then we should have v is equal to 2 times f1 minus f2. Well, f1 is ey, and f2 is minus ex. So that is equal to 2 ey minus minus ex is equal to ex plus 2 ey, which is what we defined f to be equal to. And so that's a, a way of checking that, <clears throat> you know, the, the coordinates do in fact go with the inverse transpose um, and not with the inverse or the transpose. <clears throat>
So the matrix of the scalar components of one basis relative to the other is just that. Like I said before, it's not a second order tensor, um, and we'll talk about those soon. The distinction between vectors in space, you know, so members of a vector space like V here, and its components, you know, these, or between second order tensors and matrices, which can be used to represent second order tensors once you choose a basis. It's probably the biggest stumbling block um, for people starting out in graduate level field theory classes. Um, because, you know, in undergraduate, you think of vectors as lists of numbers because they're in Rn. Um, and Rn is a vector space, but it's not necessarily the one that we're looking at. We're looking at, you know, space in general. And so, you know, like physical space. Um, and so the, the fact that the list of components relative to an arbitrary basis is itself a vector space, but those are just scalar components. They're not the vector itself. So that'll, you know, probably cause a little difficulty for a while there, but just know that the, the list of components of something relative to a basis is not the same as the vector or tensor itself. So, you know, V is equal to VI, GI is equal to VI prime, Fi is a vector in the sense that it is a member of the vector space V. The, the lists of the components, you know, i going from 1 to n, and are not members of v, um, because we didn't define v to be sets of lists. v is itself a, a vector space. Um, you know, so it could maybe the vector space V is like the space of second order polynomials or something, right? Well, then the list of the coefficients is not the same as the function. Say it's the, the list of second order polynomials on the interval <coughs> from zero to one. Um, you know, you, you can identify one with the other if you pick a set of basis vectors maybe for the polynomials your basis vectors are the constant the linear and the the quadratic you can sum them together um but to say that you know that distribution over zero to one is the same as the components they're they're not items of the same space so where were we Yeah, these are simply the lists of components. So they describe vectors, but they aren't vectors. And likewise, the matrix A that we gave there for defining the change of basis isn't a tensor. It doesn't actually do anything to a vector V. It doesn't transform it. It just allows us to compute the components of V relative to another basis 
given its components relative to the first. Let's do a little bit more with index notation and the summation convention. So let's say that we have a vector w that is the sum of two vectors u and v. Well, we have w. We can express it relative to some basis ei. We can also express relative to the same basis as ui, ei, and v in component form like this. <clears throat> now these e's here, they don't have to be you know, x, y, and z. They can be any arbitrary basis. They don't even have to be unit vectors or orthonormal or anything. All right, so, you know, you could write, we could rewrite this here in component form relative to EI as W, I, E, I, so that's a repeated index, the summation's implied, is equal to U, I, E, I, plus vi ei. Um, but since i is a dummy index here, you know, it would be equally correct to say wi ei is equal to uj ej plus vk E K <clears throat> but I, either one is correct and the top one here you know we have a whole bunch of I's there and I had mentioned that you don't want repeated indices that repeat more than twice but this top one is okay because you, it's only when you're multiplying terms together that you can't have it repeat more than twice. So if they're separated by, you know, a, a sum here, then that's okay. So like A I B I C I bad. A I B I plus C I D I fine. And we'll, we'll show that it doesn't matter um, whether you do it this way or this way. But you'll find that the top one can end up being more useful. Um, so if you think of summing the things, right, the sum i going from 1 to n, Let's say that we use just all i's for them. A, i, b, i, plus c, i, d, i, plus e, i, f, i. Well, that's the same as if we were to do the sum i going from 1 to n, 
j going from 1 to n, k going from 1 to n of a i b i plus c j <clears throat> d j plus e k f k, right? So when we do the sum over k, none of these two terms are changing. And we do the sum over j, then only this term changes in the sum over i, then only that one changes. So it, it doesn't matter, you can look at it as the single sum. So there's no ambiguity that can result from doing it, you know, this way, but there's nothing wrong with doing it this way. <clears throat> now, pretty often the, the top way is useful because if you do it this way, then you can factor out, you know, the EI from all of the terms and just look at the ith component of it. So you could do, you know, W i E i is equal to U i E i plus V i E i. Well, that's the same as, you know, you can group them. And then if we factor out the EI, so we're just looking at the ith component, we just have WI is equal to UI plus VI for each I going from 1 up to n. All right, that'll be the end of this lecture. Um, I'm going to go right up, do the math for this little bit up here with the transpose and everything, um, the way that I was originally doing it um, before I went back to the way I did it in my notes, just to show to you um, you know, as long as you do the math consistently, you will arrive at the right answer. Um, but, or at least you won't get to something incorrect. But, um, you know, what, one of the things with indices and for, for the lectures, you know, it's pretty important to stick with the notes that I worked out ahead of time. Um, Cause you, you can really kind of go, it's easy to mix up indices, you know? So it's, you'll, You'll do it a little bit and, you know, you just have to be really careful. But if you go through carefully and don't violate the rules, um, then this index notation is a pretty powerful tool. So, yeah, I'll work that one out the other way as well. So basically, formally multiply through by A inverse transpose <clears throat> and, you know, demonstrate that that this one here does in fact lead to this one here. I mean, certainly, just notionally, you can see, oh, that's multiplied by A transpose, and it's your normal matrix multiplication. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll go, you know, work out the math of that in a couple minutes here and post it. You just don't wanna find yourself doing algebra on the board or, you know, the COVID equivalent to the board, I suppose. So you guys have a good one and I'll catch you later.